that's been awful, awfully fun. Um, and so I'm going to kind of just take a minutes to do a long introduction and, and you can chime in too Russ. So we are in the middle of a cold snap. What I you know remember how last week I think was it just last week I was saying where's the snow? Well that problem's been solved. It's solved and we're also in some sort of like icy fist. So I don't know what has that done to the to the KRC uh, and the tests that, that are being conducted this week, Russ, is it made it better or made it worse? Or well, well, last last week we had clients coming into town, and we were wondering if we had enough snow. Um, and and the te the test course has been has actually been in really good shape. Um, but one of the, one of the issues that we have when we don't have much snow is we don't have snow banks on the test course, and snow banks are are really important when you're when you're testing high speed and, you, and people go off the road all the time. So <laughs> snow banks tend to stop you before you get in the trees. And so we've had a few people in the trees, but so, so getting some snow helps on that part. Um, but it's a 24 hour operation to run the test course. And it, it's like, a, it's like a mini uh, road County road commission. So we have graders and plows and drags and all kinds of things going on, which I'll talk about in the talk a little bit, but so, um, so it's, it's really it keeps the guys busy when it's snowing a lot and it's cold, but cold also makes vehicles break. And so we have stuff breaking and, and we're shorthanded. And so, so there's all kinds of things like that going on. And then working outside in this, which we have several folks that are working outside is tough too. So it's- No, I, I couldn't, honestly, I, I, I've taken my dog for a walk twice in the last three days and I get to the top of the tram road or whatever that road is and- I get a little bit further and then I'm like, I'm just too cold. And I go back yeah. and my dog is like, what's mom, you know? <laughs> yeah, and the pooches, pooches start lifting a leg and then another leg. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it's interesting. So um, yeah, I was, I was mentioning earlier <clears throat> the temperature this morning when I woke up was minus 1.7. And uh, yeah, that's, it's pretty darn, it's, and that's Fahrenheit folks. <laughs> Yeah, the wind chill's, wind chill's down around 25 below right now. So that's what I was saying earlier that I probably send my night crew home to the snowblower guys. And that's just too cold to be out there doing that. It is, it is. Noah, that, you're, you're a good boss. <laughs> well, so um, those of you who are joining us, we've already got a whole bunch of attendees. It's nice to see all of your familiar faces out there. I'm gonna um, kind of just get started by Thanking everyone for coming here. Um, I'll be introducing our speaker in a moment. So my name is Janet Callahan. I'm, I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering at Michigan Technological University. And so we're located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I can never do this right because it's like, I'm looking at myself and I don't know if I'm doing it right, but the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is, the, is, the, is in the thumb of the part that's not directly connected except by a bridge to Michigan. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful part of the world where we, I would say we have the highest quality snow of anywhere I've ever lived. And, uh, and the beauty of Lake Superior and everything as well. And so this is um, land of Michigan Tech, which was founded in, what year was it, Russ? 18? I will not be able to remember that. I was I just looking I at this today. To I know we're the late 1800s um, yes. to train mining engineers, uh, and uh, and this is a degree program we 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 still have or we do have again. And um, and so welcome anyone who's joining us. Um, uh, uh, it's awfully fun to be with you every Monday evening. All right. So this evening's speaker is Russ Alger, uh, who is um, I would I would say Russ comes from a long and, and, and um, strong family of people who have been attached in some way or graduated from Michigan Tech going back many, many generations. I understand your father, Russ, was a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. Yeah, yeah. Russ himself uh, earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the Department of Civil Engineering uh, and, and serves now. Um, and so you aren't the test course manager. What is your actual no. title at, at the KRC? So, so I'm, a, I'm a program manager and, mm -hmm. and we're broken into a few different groups here at, at KRC. And I, my group is the Institute of Snow Research. And so it's actually snow, snow and soils, but, it, but most, of the, most of the work that I do is with, with, uh, with snow, but I'd also do the same sorts of things in soil. Very good, very good. And, and so we're gonna 
be learning more from Russ in just a minute. But before we get started, I, I would like to uh, share my screen for just a few seconds. <clears throat> and um, hang on. I'm going to present just a few slides, Russ, and then we'll get started with your talk. So first of all, thank you for our sponsors, Darwin and Margarita Moon. Um, Darwin came by this week. It was wonderful to see him. And thank you again for sponsoring. This is your second sponsorship. It's, it's wonderful. All, um, all funds donated go directly to support the students, the general student scholarship fund. Uh, and so thank you for that. And the gifts uh, are being matched by the Gregory's um, up to $25,000. So um, this is how you give. Um, you can also just send an email to engineering at mtu.edu and Danielle will answer any questions you might have. Uh, we always do um, live stream these except for one time we've had a glitch and all the webinars are posted after the event. And so if you want to go back and see, uh, you know, in the library, there's been quite a few talks by various different Michigan Tech folks and you might learn um, you might learn a few things. So a quick poll question about who is joining us today. Uh, just pick one best answer, because I know some people watch this as families. So I don't know, you know, if you're a, a family of a current or a future student, you could answer that. If you are um, a student who is, you know, some, anywhere pre-college, meaning grade school on out, uh, if you're an alumnus, just, just let us know. And so Sue, Sue's already launched the poll and we have, the strongest category uh, in the area of um, attended Michigan Tech or an, you know, an alumna or an alumnus, but then an equal scattering across the whole board of, of Michigan Tech students, pre-college students, Michigan Tech family, friends of Michigan Tech, family of current students and curious people. So thank you for letting us know that. Um, it's always nice to know your audience. Um, so the... Um, I want you to know the, the next lineup. So our next talk, we, we will be uh, moving from the extreme cold to the extreme hot, I guess. Volcanoes being the extreme hot. So we'll be learning about volcanoes next with Simon Karn from the Department of Geological and Mining Engineering and Sciences. Uh, and you can see the lineup. I just wanna remind everybody there's no session on March 1st. That is um, an early spring break for, for the team here. Um, I don't think I meant to stop share. Um, might have meant to stop share. Let's see, what was next? Um, well, I think I've gotten through the main points I wanted to mention. And so at, at this point, I would like to um, introduce this evening's speaker. And so Russ, go ahead and, and share your screen while I'm introducing you. So this evening's speaker is Russ Alger, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, is um, has been with Michigan Tech uh, since since the day he was born, uh, because his father was also a Michigan Tech faculty member in the Department of Civil Engineering. So Russ is going to tell us a little bit more about his career along the way, but um, he is um, program manager at the Institute of Snow Research at Michigan Technological University up here in the Upper Peninsula. And an interesting thing about Russ is he's been to Antarctica six times. Um, and for the longest time period he was there, he was there for three and a half months. He has fallen into a, um, crevices or crevasses or however we say them uh, and, been, and been pulled back out of them. And uh, um, he is part of a team who found a way to get from McMurdo base uh, to the New South Pole. Uh, and that means finding a, 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 a road or a way to transport materials other than having them flown in by, by plane. But the topic of this evening's um, talk is about snow. And so Russ, can you take it from here? All right. So there's, um, there's a, a, a uh, um, something on the screen in front of my slides. Is that, uh, uh, no, that I got it. That, that doesn't interfere with what we're seeing. So we're okay. seeing- Yeah, I, I couldn't see my slides though. <laughs> All right, so, so hello everybody. Um, tonight I'm gonna do a, do, a, do a quick little talk about snow and, and some of the things that I've done and, and, and studied over the years. Um, the photo in the background on my first slide here has just a, a pile of equipment that I use to, um, to take different measurements when I'm out in the field. This, 
this particular one happens to be up in the mountains of Montana. Um, and I'm working with some snowmobile, uh, snowmobile company and, and looking at um, snow mobility as related to snowmobiles and deep snow. So we're digging deep snow pits. I've done dug many a snow pit in my life uh, in lots of different places. Um, it's actually kind of nice once you get the pit built so you can get in and get out of the wind, but it's a nice place to hide. So the, what, what, I'll, what I'll do, uh, the, the progression of what I'll talk about today is, um, or tonight is, uh, first was Snow 101, which is, which is just a basic overview of snow. Uh, and then I'll get into what we do, the different things that we do to um, change or change the consistency, consistency of snow to, to test on it. So I'll talk about the test course, what we do to, to build the test course, and, and what we do to um, make things like snowmobile trails and that sort of thing. Um, so that's consistency and manipulation. Some of the measurements that we do to, to um, look at strength of snow and, and try and relate it to how vehicles op perform or whatever in the snow. Uh, then snow around the world, which is, um, if you're familiar with, or, you, or if you've been around, been around snow and, and, um, and folks that work in the snow, there's always the argument of who has the most different types of snow and uh, our snow is different than your snow sort of thing. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then lastly, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on ice testing. So we, we, do, we do quite a bit of that too. Um, so, so snow can become ice, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, like if you look at glacier ice, it's, it's formed by uh, lots of deep snow and the, and the pressure finally turns it into ice. So, so similar materials. So I'm going to talk a little bit about snow in the air and, and, but, but it's, um, I don't do a lot of study of, of the particles in the air, but you hear, you hear things like, oh, there's 72 different types of snow and there's a hundred different types of snow. And you, you can look around all over the place and people claim that there's all different types. Um, there are lots of different types of snowflakes. So if, so if you go outside, which I do, and, and I've been teased about it more than once, um, that I'm a snow geek and I catch snow on my jacket. And uh, I love my black fleece jacket because snowflakes tend to stick on that and, and fleece tends to stay cold on the outside and warm on the inside. So you can catch flakes and look at the shapes of them. And, and if you do that, you'll find that there's some really cool ones. Um, so we have the thing that's that that I call Christmas snow, which is the thing is the snowflake that you see hanging all around the windows and people put on their Christmas trees and whatever. And nice six six legs and some fluffy little arms on them and that sort of thing. Those are dendrites. Um, mm -hmm. But if you but if you if you actually watch and 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 catch snowflakes and and see the different ones, you'll find that that um, there's things that I, that are called grovels, and those are the little snowballs that you see that. Um, it, it snows snowballs and they're hard and they bounce and if they hit you in the head sometimes they sting. Um, there's columns, there's needles, there's all sorts of different ones. Um, rhyme coated ones which are kind of cool so um, that sometimes you can actually see a dendrite which is a Christmas snow covered with ice and if you look at it it looks like a little cookie so it'll be thick. Um, so there's lots of different types of snow as precipitation. Our most of the work that I do is the snow fell, it's on the ground and it starts to change. So, so my studies are what's happening to it as it's changing. Um, so we get in, in Houghton, we get on average 25 feet of snow. And if, and if, you, if you've driven up to Copper Harbor, you've seen the snow thermometer there that shows that the 30 feet of snow that's falls and that has fallen in different, at different times and that the average is about 25. And people stop and get their picture there, as you, as you know, a lot and, and, and wonder and contemplate about why there isn't 25 feet, feet of snow on the ground or think to themselves, oh, my God, what do these people do? How do they get out of their houses if there's 25 feet of snow on the ground? <laughs> well, we know that there isn't. So four feet's a lot. Sometimes we get five, but very seldom. Um, so what happens to that 25 feet? So... Once it's on the ground, snow tends to do something that we call metamorphism. And, and so, so snow is actually a really cool material because it changes all the time, and which makes it why it's difficult for some of the things that we do, some of the studies that we do. So unlike soil, soil is soil. Is soil. 
uh, for the most part, it is the, par the particles stay the same size. They don't change at all. Um, the density of the soil can change a little bit here and there. The moisture can change, but for the most part, it doesn't change. Snow, on the other hand, does. So if you take that, Chris that, that, that Christmas snow crystal and you, and you watch it fall and hit the, hit the ground, as, it, well, as it's falling through the air, it's even doing this, but once it's on the ground, it cha it's changing and it wants to become a pellet. So after a while, if you dig down into the snow, you're not gonna find that Christmas snow anymore. You're gonna find a whole bunch of pellets and they'll look like little marbles um, and, and other things, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And that's metamorphism. And what's happening there is the arms are getting pulled to the center, similar to what you'd think as, of gravity. So the center of that crystal is being pulled in and the arms are becoming an ice pellet. So there's several, several different kinds of metamorphism. One is equal temperature. And that is um, what I was just talking about. And if you look at this, at, at the snowflake here, it's becoming some, something that looks less and less and less like a flake until it just becomes a crystal. Um, can you see my cursor when I have it on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, so this kind of gives you an idea of what, what the equal temperature metamorphism is. And that's um, water vapor is moving from the outside of the crystal to the middle and becoming a pellet. The next one is temperature gradient metamorphism, and that is the ground is warm, the air is cold. So on a really cold night, the, the, um, the, the, the moisture is moving from the ground up to the surface and crystals are forming as that moisture moves up. And these ones will look like um, little, uh, um, kind of like pyramids, six-sided pyramids. So if you dig down close to the ground, you'll find that those crystals are all set, set in there and they're real fragile. They're kind of just in piles and we call that depth or. So, so it grows by the moisture moving up from the ground, up through the pack and it forms those crystals. And they can become really distinct if there's an ice layer and they grow underneath the ice layer. So another thing that we look for, and avalanche people look for these crystals. And that they're, they're real fragile and avalanches can slide on them because they're just kind of sitting there um, in a pile and the whole, the whole upper part of the snow can slide on them. So another different type of metamorphism. So now as these things are happening, the crystals are getting smaller and the snowpack condenses. So that's why we don't have, one of the reasons we don't have 25 feet of snow on the ground. The next one that we that we look for is melt freeze, and what this is is either a light rainstorm or a, a melt. So so we get a warm day in January and, and it melts on the surface, and then it gets cold again and it refreezes. So if you dig down through that snowpack, you'll find these ice layers in there, and they're and they're strong. You can and sometimes you can stand on them, um, and and those are kind of like growth rings in a tree. They're they're um, their history of, of when we had a melt or when we had a light rain that fell on the surface. And then the last one is pressure metamorphism. And that, that is the weight of the snow above compressing what's down below. And the picture in the background here is a picture of an open crevasse. This is in, Antar in Antarctica. And I'm up on top and we had walked down and looked inside the crevasse. So this is a big hole in the ground, it's two, 200 feet deep. and um, and in this case, we filled it in with a, with a bulldozer so we could walk down inside. But th the interesting thing here is in the background is a, this line that's, that's kind of alongside there. When you get down inside the crevasses, and in this particular place, we were, we were next to an active volcano. Uh, it's called Mount Erebus. And Erebus um, erupts occasionally. And, and when you walk down inside the crevasse, you can see all the lenses of all the, all the dust that was formed from each of the, of the um, uh, eruptions over the years. So it's kind of like a, again, a history of, of when things, when things blew up or when the, when the, or the um, volcano blew up. And we actually took samples of those and brought them back and some volcanologists um, took them and we're going to study when, what all those different things were. So as I mentioned yeah. earlier, earlier snow um, is changing all the time and it, and it's, um, the study of it is kind of cool because that's because that's happening. And uh, and one of the things that happens with snow is it is it bonds to itself. So unlike soil, soil just sits there and it doesn't it doesn't ever 
form a bond between particles unless it really gets if a glacier rolls over it and it becomes rock kind of thing. Um, snow tends to want to bond. So the crystals are becoming these, these little pellets, but the pellets are actually sticking to each other in, in some, at, at some time. So, so one of the things that we do, and um, if, if we're looking at, for instance, grooming a snowmobile trail, we want it to bond, or, or we're making a road on the test course, we want it to bond. And there's ways to force that. So the, the big crystals that I show here um, are wherever they touch, they start to bond. And that's from moisture moving from the from the curvature down into the to the places where the where the um, crystals are touching, and what what happens here is the big crystals start to suck up the little crystals, and they just keep becoming bigger and bigger as things go along, and you get these little bonds that form in them, and then the bonds are can be strong, can be fragile. So when we the, the way we the way we get things to bond is we, we try and force the density to come up, which means compact and get as much air out of it as we can and get the crystals to touch each other. So the more we get to touch, the more we get bonds. Increased surface energy. So this happens without getting too complicated. This happens by the surface energy of the crystals. So the, more, the smaller they are and the more curvature they have, the more they tend to want to bond to each other. So we can force that to happen. And, that, and what we do there is break a crystal. So if we break a crystal in half, it gets high energy and it wants to bond to the other crystals. Increase the temperature to a point so we can get some liquid water in the, in the snow. And liquid water can be in there at 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So there can be water vapor that, that cold and it isn't frozen. So if we get that vapor in there, it can tend to help bond too. Eventually it just lubricates. So it, it becomes slush instead of, instead of bond. Same thing with injecting water, although injecting water is hard because it freezes really fast. And then particulates like dust are bad. So they get in between the crystals and that keeps it from bonding. And we know that and try and avoid any dirt that we possibly can. So how do we compact? Um, this again is, is that same same picture that I showed before, only now I'm in the hole trying to stay warm. Um, <laughs> so, so my equipment's there and, and, and we've been out snowmobiling, we're up in the mountains here, and we've been out snowmobiling looking at traction. So we have, two, we, 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 call, we call the stuff that we do with vehicles in the snow, we, we, we say we are working in deep snow or shallow snow. And what that is, is shallow snow Whatever I'm doing, if it's me walking, if it's me driving a snowmobile, me driving an army tank, whatever that is, if the vehicle can feel that the ground is there, it's shallow snow. If it's so deep that the vehicle doesn't care whether it's 100 feet deep or 50 feet deep, it doesn't know the ground is there, it's deep snow. And what I mean by that is snow tends to compact against something hard e easily, and it doesn't compact so well if it's really, really deep. Hence the reason we get the hard layer that we get on the road. So, so if the highway, every highway here right now, since it's cold and it's been snowing is covered with snow, this hard layer of snow, very slippery, very hard, hard to get off. And the reason that compacts like that is because it has the pavement underneath it. And the way that we do that is uh, the way that we, the way that we compress snow is we can, use the tracks of a vehicle. So a big tracked vehicle, which you'll see going on the snowmobile trail. We use plates, which is the snowmobile trail groomer. We use rollers. We don't see too many rollers around here, although they do use them on ski trail, ski hills a lot and more out west than they do in, the, in this area. And then we use a lot of wheels at KRC. So, so similar to the highway right now, getting, getting the snow compacted on it by vehicles driving over it. And then we use vibration, which is similar to a vibrating compactor that you'd see on the soil. Or we jump up and down on it. <laughs> so the next thing that we do, as I mentioned, was we can increase the surface energy. And the way we do that is we grind up the snow. So we can, we can grind it up, we can crush it. So tilling and milling is grinding. And then we can also mix it. So if we, so as I mentioned earlier, the small crystals and the big crystals is what we want to do to bond. So if we mix mix the older snow in with fresh snow, we can make it bond a lot quicker. So going out and mixing the old snowmobile trail and with the new snow that's fallen is a good thing to do. 
And bonding can happen really quickly and it can happen slowly. And in general, bonding is slow when it's cold and fast when it's a little warmer. Um, 25 degrees is about as warm as you, as you can get. Anything above that, it doesn't tend to want to bond. So just some photos. This is Antarctica. And this was my, the last couple of times I was there, I was uh, worked on uh, building snow roads. And as I mentioned, th this is a deep snow area. So it's really hard to get the snow to compact. So the piece of equipment that I, I and another, another um, uh, engineer from the local area here um, have developed over the years um, is good at making, making a hard surface up of what we call a snow pavement on deep snow. So it's, so it's in essence a floating piece of pavement the, the snow underneath it is really weak, but we build it thick enough that it can support vehicles. So the, the upper picture is a stuck vehicle in the softer snow. And the one below is this vehicle is going from right to left. And you notice that it doesn't even make a, doesn't even make a tire print. So we, wow. built, we built that road and, and, and then this is a big tractor here. And I'm down taking a picture of the tread sitting on top of it. So it's kind of, kind of a cool thing. This is a picture of some of the equipment that we use. So we have lots of packers like this that have all kinds of wheels in them that, that are simulating uh, vehicles on the snow. We have drags. This is this is actually the the in, uh, invention that I have. Uh, I and another engineer have patent on, um, and of course plows and all that sort of thing. So some of the basic properties that we measure are, of course, the depth and looking for layering. Like I said earlier, there's ice lenses. We, we uh, measure the temperature. So we know a lot of things we can de deduct from that. We measure the density. So how, how packed is the snow? How, 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 um, um, yeah, how packed is it? Uh, how much free water content is in it? And, they, and as I mentioned earlier, you can actually have liquid water in the snow down as cold as 10 degrees. And that water can either help you the bond or make, make things uh, slushy. Um, so it's anywhere from dry to slush. And then the crystal structure, which I had talked about earlier. So do we have um, temperature gradient metamorphism? Is it, is it advanced? How much of it is there? And that sort of thing. So again, the equipment that I use, um, you know, the measuring densities and I look at crystals and all the time, structure of crystals, um, free water content, uh, density tubes. So I have all kinds of little toys that I haul around with me. We also have some different ways that we measure strength. So this is a is a um, penetrometer that I that I made that I took to Antarctica with me and I mounted it on the front of a vehicle. So as we traveled across the thousands of miles we went there, we, I could take measurements from inside the vehicle and get an idea of what the snow strength was. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do a lot of drilling, uh, several different types of strength measurements we can do and, and uh, to get an idea of how strong the snow is. And of course, there's a lot of weather effects. Again, another picture from Antarctica. Um, do a lot of sitting in Antarctica. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking before the thing started, um, before this talk started, uh, you need to be able to see the crevasses. And so anytime, and, and make sure you're not getting yourself into something bad. So anytime it's it's snowing hard, the wind's blowing hard, uh, the sun's not right. You do a lot of sitting, waiting for it to get nice again so you can keep on moving. So things like wind, humidity, solar, snow temperature, ground temperature, <coughs> all those sorts of things that, um, affect how the snow is changing and metamorphosing. So this is <coughs> the, <coughs> the background picture here is one of my um, money shots, if you want to put it that way. This is Toby Canari standing in front here. He was, he was supposed to be in, in on the talk today. He's our test course manager, but he ended up with some emergencies on the course and he's stuck there. But so this is, this is our groomer. And this is a track, the tractor that we had to tow it around in Antarctica. In the background is Cape Evans. And um, that is uh, Scott's last hut from when he headed out toward the, towards the South Pole and never made it there, or, or well, depends on how you believe, whether he made it and he was on his way back when he died or he was on his way there. But this is his, his hut that he left from. And very few people get to go here. And we got, we got a 
Toby and I got a call one morning to, on a Sunday morning, wondering if we wanted to groom the trail out to Cape Evans. So we, we took the groomer out there and it was, it's 40 miles from McMurdo on the sea ice. So we're on the sea ice here and we went out to, to um, uh, Scott's hut. And uh, this is called Terra Nova. So if you're, if you're, um, if you're interested in, in what it is, but at Terra Nova, Scott's ship is still there and the mass is sticking up through the ice. So you can walk up and you can touch the mast. Um, all of their stuff that they left behind is in there. So their sleeping bag, some sleeping bags and food and all sorts of things are inside the hut. At the time there was, there, they ended up leaving one husky behind when they left. And the husky was still there with its collar on and leash. Of course, all, de all just mostly fur and bone, but um, that husky is left since we were there. It was there when we were there. Um, but since then it's now in the Smithsonian. They picked it up and took it to the Smithsonian. So it was, was one of one of Scott's dogs. So it was a really cool place to go. Um, and a, a funny story about it was um, Toby, we, we went out, we had to cross some ice bridges and big cracks in the ice and that sort of thing. And we got out there and we finally got back to town and it took us all day to go out there and back. We got back to town and Toby said, oh my gosh, that was fun. And, and, and we were talking to some other folks at McMurdo and, and Toby said, oh, I was really glad that Russ was with, with me because it was a little spooky out there. And, there were some places where I was pretty scared with cracks and, and crossing the ice. And, and I said, I'm glad Russ was with me because he knew, knows about that. And I looked at him, I said, you know what, Toby, I know nothing about sea ice. And he's, <laughs> I, got really big. And he's I mean, I can tell you about snow, but I know nothing about sea ice. He said, you, you didn't? And I'm like, nope, we just went and that was that. So, so really, really cool thing that I got to do. Um, like I say, very few people have ever gotten to go there. And it was neat to go and walk over there and see it. So the other pictures are mountains, uh, Montana, and and the one on the bottom is a, a test course in New Zealand uh, that, that does similar to what we do. And Toby and I went there and visited that and visited some folks that we knew at, at, in New Zealand to look at their test course. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the other things that I've done a bit of is there's a lot of testing that gets done in, the, in big cold rooms. So looking at how does snow accumulate on vehicles? How does it get into the hood? How does it hurt the vehicle? That sort of thing. And so there's a lot of interest in um, how does this snow compare to the snow uh, that we see in the real world? So we do some of that because um, it's, it's tough, tough to make snow that's exactly like what we see in the real world. <clears throat> and then we do a lot of ice testing. And, and with that, we're looking at friction. So how slippery is it? We're looking at the roughness of the ice. So what, what is, how, do, how is it affecting um, the sensors on the car? So some, of the, some companies are really interested in, um, you know, is, is there chatter from the ice and, and, uh, and um, how, how does that affect traction control, stability control, anti-lock brakes, that sort of thing. Uh, and ice changes, changes friction with temperature. So um, Janet was mentioning earlier that the snow was squeaky. So it's it's really cold and and you and you get that on the ice also that you can actually get better friction when it's colder sometimes when it's not. We look at the strength of the ice. Uh, this this one I won't get into too too much because it's a little bit complicated. But we also are interested in um, how how much energy does it take to melt the snow. So if we're airports actually have snow melters. So they're, they're, they're melting the snow and they're dumping the water down in the drain. Chicago is big for this, Chicago O'Hare. So um, just a little, little bit of an explanation. It's a little hard to, hard to read all through, but how much energy it takes and how much fuel it would take to, to make a hundred gallons of water out of, out of snow. So finally, finally, we're to the, to the point of, of what does this all mean as far as our test course at KRC? So one of the things that we strive for, as I mentioned several times so far, snow changes all the time. So, so as, it, as it's falling through the air, when it gets on the ground, it's changing. It's changing with temperature and sun and all that sort of thing. Um, what we want to be able to try and do for the testers is have today be the same as tomorrow would be the same as the next day. And that's really hard to do. So we do a lot of things to try and make the test course be as comparable as possible. Because engineers come and, and they're testing tires and they're testing traction control or whatever. They want to be able to say, today I tested uh, algorithm A, tomorrow I tested 
algorithm B, or I'm going to test algorithm B. The day before that, I tested algorithm C. How do they compare? And we want to be able to say, all right, one's better than the other. But did the snow change that much that one's not better than the other? So we're really big on trying to build the snow, the test course to be comparable day to day. And, and KRC has done a really good job with that. And, and Toby has been in charge of it. He's, he, as, as I've said to, to Janet a few times, I, I always say Toby's the expert in the world on how to build snow, snow um, courses. And we have people come here and, and learn from him at, at times. So the people that test here really like it because he can get the test course to be this very similar from day to day to day and comparable. Uh, the, the picture down here is a, is a um, snow tire and the little mountain with the snowflake. If you ever, if you ever look at your, if you actually own real snow tires, they are, they are real snow tires only because they have that stamp on them, that mountain with the snowflake. So if you're, if you ever wonder if your snow tire is really a snow tire, if it doesn't have that mountain and flake, it's not. Uh, and the, and those, there's two companies that come here and do, do just that test to put, to, to tell it, to say there, actually there's more than that. Several companies that come here and, and do testing to be able to say yes or no, is this a snow tire or is it not? So this is a picture of part of our test course. Uh, it's a thousand acres uh, and I forget how many miles of test course there are um, of miles of lane that get plowed. But as I mentioned earlier, it's like a mini um, county road commission. So we have big equipment, big blowers, graders, plows, all sorts of things to, to make this course. Uh, checkerboards, this is a paved area that has ice checkerboard. So vehicles can come on, uh, we, we have some a lot of a lot of truck um, testing gets done. Semi trucks, they come on here and they can they can hit the dry pavement and then onto ice, then onto checkerboards with ice, one wheel on, one wheel off, and and just see what the system does. So can it handle that? Can it handle being on ice and on pavement all at the same time? So we have lots of that, and we have slopes and all sorts of things. How do we build the course? So the first thing we do is we try to get the ground frozen because we don't want the um, temperature gradient metamorphism to hap happen under our road. So we want the snow to stay consistent through the winter. So we freeze the ground, we get snow off of it, we pack the snow onto it and try and get it frozen so we don't have any mud and the ground's not warm. And then we compact the snow in layers. So something I haven't mentioned as, as I was going along here is snow doesn't like to be packed, compacted in a big chunk. So it, it um, it, it likes to be compacted in layers, similar to soil, which is what we do when we do construction. We, we put the soil in layers and compact it in layers. We remove all the drift and, and excess snow. We don't want it to be bumpy, so we don't want drifts over there. We don't want to drive over them. And we don't want, again, compact too much snow. Work around clients, which is a hard thing. So right now, um, right now we're testing in the daytime because it's cold. Last week, we were testing at night because it was warm in the day and they didn't want to be testing when it was slushy out. So they test at night in the dark when it's colder. So working around their schedules can be tough. So we'll work at night. And lastly, we're really big on keeping the snow clean. And the reason for that is, is anywhere dirt gets on the snow, Toby calls it cancer. Um, it gets on the snow and it melts the snow. So we get potholes all over the place if we get dirt dirt on it. We have our own car wash. So it's a commercial car wash that all the cars have to go through and be washed before they're allowed to go out there. So no dirty cars are allowed on, no dirty trucks. Uh, just so happens that there's a, a local entity here that has a truck car wash also that's on the airport property. And we, we actually use that occasionally too. Um, rent rent time to go through the car wash. So all trucks are all trucks and cars are clean. So I am a snow geek and I have spent a lot of time cruising around looking at snow. Uh, my magnifying glass and my my snowboard. And my if if you know if you know my wife and you've talked to her, you'll find out that one of the, one of her me biggest memories of me was our very first date was me walking along the canal in, in Houghton with her. And uh, with my black fleece jacket on, catching snowflakes and saying, "Oh my gosh, look at this one!" <laughs> somehow, she, somehow she still married me, and I'm not sure why. But she had to, she had had to be scratching her head, saying, "Oh my gosh, this guy's strange." Um, but it does, it does excite me, and, uh, and I've had a lot of fun 
fun chasing snow around the world, all the different places I've been. And lastly, oh. still still jump up up and down. And this this for this picture, if you it, sadly, if you Google my name, this picture usually comes up first. Um, <laughs> this this so happens to be Christmas Day, 1995. I was out in the middle of Antarctica. We were we were celebrating Christmas, myself and three other guys that were on the expedition with me, and they dared me to go out in my boots and hat and and gloves. And it just so happened that I had my Rudolph the Red Nose reindeer shorts with me. And I put those on for the photos. I shouldn't tell these stories. So so we were out, out on snowmobile and living in tents for, for three and a half months. And um, and this was Christmas Day. We I don't I think we'd been out um, about a month and a half at this by this time and hadn't seen anybody else but ourselves for that long. So we were all getting a little stir crazy. And that's all I have. Oh my goodness, Russ! What a what a pleasure to hear um, some of your snow experience and 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 to see this, <laughs> you know, this crazy man out there. What what temperature would it have been? Oh, it was always cold. Um, <laughs> very very seldom above zero. Um, so zero Fahrenheit. So it, it, you just get used to the cold. Yeah, I mean, you're sleeping, oh. sleeping in the in the in a sleeping bag and no heat for for months. You get you get pretty good at. Uh, I lost a lot of weight there, that's for sure. And I grew lots of <laughs> grew lots of hair. <laughs> All right. So um, at this point, I just want to kind of point out to the general audience that you can ask questions in the Q and A field, which if you scroll down into your um, onto your, um, down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see Q&A. And you can go ahead and probably stop sharing screen now, Russ, uh, so people can see your face. Uh, and so there's lots of questions. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank Jerry, Bruce, Nicole, Stacy, Lee, Marie, and Leonard, who point out that Michigan Tech was founded in 1885 to train mining engineers. Uh, and um, and, uh, and then, so, um, Russ, you can see the questions if you click on the Q&A icon. So if you see yep. any you want to answer right away, you can go ahead and pull them out. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just kind of read a, read a few questions. The first one came in from, from Walt. Um, uh, what snow tires do you have on your personal car and why? And does Houghton still sell sawdust tires? I, I don't think there are any any sawdust tires anymore. I, I know of them and I've heard of them and seen them and and uh, I imagine there probably are still some floating around in someone's garage somewhere. Um, I I have Coopers on Cooper snow tires on my truck just because they're not too expensive and and they work fairly well. Um, uh, I don't know. There's you get a lot a lot of different stories about who thinks a good snow what a good snow tire is. All the companies have put a lot of effort into them, and I, th I think they're probably, for the most part, pretty comparable. Um, I think the biggest difference is, is how long they last. And for us, that's not such a big deal because we have snow on the road all the time, so they don't wear out so much. But in an area like Detroit, let's say, for instance, to have a real snow tire, um, they, they're soft. So, so one, of, one of the ways that we get grip from in a snow tire is by making the rubber softer. And, and softer means it wears quicker, so mm -hmm. a little tougher to. So um, some of the companies uh, um, boast that there's that their tire lasts longer, and and so you pay a little bit more for them, but they last a little bit longer, that kind of thing. So no, it's interesting because um, you know, and the temperature is such a variable relative to whether you can stop your car. So I I. Coming down from Sharon, I usually take Agate, which gets pretty steep toward the bottom. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And you know, I go slow. I'm in low gear, but still, you're supposed to stop at all the stop signs. And I remember just a week ago. Now it's now you can stop on a dime because it's it's really cold. But I was, you know, I have analog brakes, and and I'm like, huh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to stop in time. Right. <laughs> so I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Yeah. No, it's interesting. But people here in the area, everybody imagines people aren't going to be able to stop at a stop sign and they just wait and see, are, are they going to be able to stop? <laughs> Where should I go? There's a yeah, Houghton, Houghton and Hancock are interesting towns to be in an area that has as much snow as it has. There's no doubt about that. The hills, the hills make it interesting. 
No, you said it. Well, and so Sid, um, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but Sid asks, how do the large ski slopes make their snow? Okay, so so one of the things that I didn't mention earlier um, when I was when I showed the slide with all the different snowflakes, so the the flakes will will start by um, something some particle falling through the through the air, so it's from way up above, and it and it can be a dust particle or an ice particle. So so water vapor is frozen into a pellet, and then the crystals tend to grow off of that. So uh, depending on a, what the wind's like, what the temperature is up above, how much humidity is there up above, is there uplift, is there downlift? So lots of things affect how, what the crystals look like. So, so that's the, nat the way natural snow forms. Um, I don't do a lot of work with, with um, snow making, but know a bit about it. Um, so, so what a snow gun does, uh, what, well, what you wanna do is you wanna throw you want to throw water up into the air and get it to freeze it, and fall back down as snow. Problem with snow making is, is you can never get it, it, it. Oh, you can. It's hard to get it up in the air long enough to make it freeze enough mm. and it falls back to the ground. So very similar to what I was saying about the cold room snow and the picture of the cars with the with the snow stuck on them. So what we're doing there is we're we're, we're running a snow maker in essence inside of a room inside of a cold room. And trying to quickly make snow as quick as we can. Um, in general, it's wet snow because it never has time to freeze enough. So the snow we're seeing right now outside is really cold. It's coming from a long ways up. Um, it's cold enough that it, it's pretty dry and pretty frozen by the time it gets here. Tough to do that with, with snow making snow because we can't launch the water far up high enough that as it falls back down, it freezes solid. So a snow gun, makes a small pellet of ice and throws it out and hopes that it's frozen enough. And then it starts to form some, if, some crystals on it if it can. So, so a pellet is getting thrown out into a, into a mist of, there's a mister that is part of the gun. And as that pellet goes through the mist, it's, it forms a, a snow crystal, it never becomes a flake really because it doesn't have enough time to become one. But So that's kind of how it works. It's complicated, but. Oh, I'm just going to put in a plug for materials science and engineering, where we we this is where you kind of learn all about nucleation and growth. And yeah. Center. You were talking yeah. about sintering, which is yeah. you know like it's a there you go. It's fascinating um, to think about how crystals like to um, decrease their energy by growing and reducing the number of grain boundaries and things like that. So if if you find this interesting in your future student, your field might be material science. Yes. So John asks um, whether Michigan Tech students get to drive on the Keweenaw Research Center, you know, super secret course. Okay, so so we at um, KRC is a, is a soft money funded uh, institute of the university. But we hire a lot, so we, so we don't. We're not really. Um, none of us are really instructors. I've I've taught a few classes. Um, our director Jay Meldrum, I shouldn't I, I should say he is an instructor. He teaches um, uh, alternative energies on campus. So he's out of out of everybody. He's pretty much the one that that does that teaches. But we hire about twenty five or more students every year. So we hire undergrads and. And they stay here through their time. Some of them go on for their masters, and um, they actually get to work as uh, on a project, so a real project. And so they get to use vehicles. They get to. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of autonomous stuff right now, so they're working on that. So the students get to do some really cool stuff, <laughs> and and most of our students when they when they leave end up getting really good jobs because they've mm -hmm. been here. They've worked a real job. Um, the young students get mentored by the older students, which is really good for the older students because they get to learn to be teachers. Um, and and they, they take the younger students under their wings and show them how to do things. And so it's really cool. Um, I've had a lot of fun with students over the years, just working with them and seeing how they grow and, and learn things and that sort of thing. So it's kind of fun. And yes, they do get to get in the vehicles. Well, and so, um... Do you want to describe where the testing facility is located? Okay, so we're at the at the Houghton County Airport, and and a, a chunk of the property that we have the test course set up on is on 
airport property. And then we also, Michigan Tech owns a fairly good sized piece that's adjacent to that, that we've purchased over the years. Um, if you if you go online and look for advertisement of, of KRC, you won't find much. And, and the reason for that is, is the clients that come here like that. They're, they're doing testing and, and, and they're not, they aren't here because they want to be advertised. They want to be here and, and get their things done and not have a lot of cameras floating around. And they're so we're, we don't allow any cameras on, on the course. We don't allow um, no TV stations, anything like that, unless they're invited in, in the beginning and, and we know all about it and we're fully in control of what they do and don't do. So it's kind of neat. Um, and the, and the clients really like that. So we, we do quite a bit of military work and, and of course, proprietary um, car companies and truck companies, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. And, and so they're, they're particular about who's, who's standing around watching what's going on. So. Well, and I understand we are one of the only functioning facilities with the strange snow year we've had um, uh, and that uh, you guys are pretty maxed out in business um, past, past few yeah, weeks. We're we're really busy. You know, we've been uh, um, even even with the COVID thing going on. It's been surprising. We we weren't sure coming into the season what who was going to come and whether the, you know what was it just going to be a dead season. And but as it turns out, we've been super busy. Um, and on top of that, we have snow and a lot of other places don't. So so we get <clears throat> we get um, calls from other other folks that are were supposed to test somewhere else, but their but their course they were headed to isn't isn't right and and uh, mm -hmm. so we get a lot of that but we're, we're pretty busy and pretty booked well and so there's a couple curious question about christmas day how cold was it and then uh how long did you stay outside with just your shorts on uh not very long <laughs> you know. yeah, but it, it's it's kind of tough when you're there in a in a tent and, you, and there's just no way to warm up and uh, although the sun does shine a lot in antarctica and it's amazing when you get inside your tent it does warm up from the sun so you can get the days where it's where it's really sunny and you can get 30 40 degrees inside your tent or or ones that you really enjoy so oh boy no you must be a rugged husky that's all i can say i was thinking about that poor husky left behind there must be a story behind that but you you are one rugged rugged husky i will t i will say that all right this question is what is the most amazing snowflake you have ever seen and why um, I, I guess, yeah, um, not, 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 not really a snowflake, but, um, so, uh, there, there's a, I only, uh, most people have probably seen, uh, when frost forms like on the trees that are on the ice and you get the, get the, you wake up in the morning and you've had this cold night and a, and a moist, just clear sky and a moist air comes in and, and you get all these cool, cool, um, uh, crystals that grow off of walls and trees and that sort of thing. Um, in Antarctica and in inside their crevasses, you, these things can grow really big. So, so when you get down inside of a crevasse, they've been they've been there for hundreds of years, and so these crystals can grow inside of there and they grow for a long period of time. So I, I've been in a couple of different crevasses and I have some really cool pictures of this, but um, where the, the crystals were growing off the wall of the crevasse and they were as big as paper plates. And they look like a snow, big snowflake growing off the wall of the crevasse. They're real fragile, you just touch them and they just disintegrate. Um, but it's really calm and, and minus 40 degrees inside of almost every crevasse I've ever went inside of um, and, and, and dead calm. So these crystals can grow from what little bit of moisture is in there. So, so the coolest, coolest snowflake is, is that. You know, these huge things that grow and they are just big flakes. Um, and, and then as I mentioned earlier, the rime coated crystals are cool to see. So if you ever can, it's usually warmer, more humid days that those will form and you can, they look like cookies and if you catch them and they get fairly big, um, kind of neat. And then there's, um, there's ones that they call capped columns. So they get little columns and they, if you look at them, they're, they're actually a column and they get, they get a, a cookie on either end of it so it looks kind of like a little barbell and that's good those are kind of neat too so go out and look for look at crystals it's fun to do and everyone will think you're nuts but that's all right no i like crystals too 
And metals are crystals, them. Yes, yes. So I'm going to interrupt because I, your this this last question reminded me that I was going to show you a few slides from Winter Carnival. So I'm sharing screen. So the theme of Winter Carnival, which is just completed um, yesterday, mm -hmm. was our favorite cartoons for snowy afternoons. Um, so that was the 2021 theme. And so um, what you're seeing on the left and middle and to the right, um, you're seeing just a couple of kind of famous places on campus <coughs> where, and this is the construction effort that kind of goes into it, which is all about compacting the snow and making it strong and mm -hmm. making it structurally able to withstand further and further loads on top of it. And um, so you can see some of the, so these are, this is a competition we have here at Michigan Tech uh, and it's so super much fun. They, we have a, we have, we take two days off, Thursday and Friday are off and it's usually right around the first week of, of February. So here are some, um, this is the, probably, um, I believe this is the night before, there's sort of a, there's two different competitions and I'm not gonna be able to tell you which is which, but um, the, um, there's a furious building effort that goes on the night before the morning of the, comp of the judging. And so you can, you can just see a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of different um, student, and these are all student groups um, kind of working on these and they, every, every group has their proprietary way of building a snow statue. And I think I should have a Husky Bites on this next year. I think I definitely will kind of. That would um, be cool. That would be fun. Uh, yeah, so, so, and so here's some of the final products you can see, um, you know, just some really just beautiful, beautiful sculpting and artistic um, ren render, rendering of, of, of many, many things. And so like oddly and, infamously, right? There was no snow right up until like the day of the judging. And then it began to snow furiously yeah. for the next yeah. sort of 36, 48, like it's still snowing, uh, you know, ever since then. So I, and and I'm not gonna be able to call out who the winners were, but I'm sure if you're, um, a, you know, if you like cartoons, you're gonna recognize some of these famous um, cartoon characters. Uh, and uh, it was, it's, it's so magical to walk around on campus uh, uh, during winter carnival and after winter carnival. All right, and so that was where my slideshow previously shut up. I'm gonna um, bring it back to the questions now that we've um, that I've shown them. Uh, and so Ellie has a question: um, How do you mark the snow pavement so no one drives off? And and so I think she's referring to the Antarctica. Okay, so so the. Um, uh... The trail from McMurdo out to the South Pole is about a thousand miles long. So it's a thousand miles, a little bit more than that, from McMurdo to the South Pole. And every quarter of a mile, there's this bamboo pole with a flag on it the entire way. And, and the rule is, as you're traveling, if you can't see two flags, you have to stop and wait till you can see two flags. So the whole way there is marked that way. And of course, it's also GPS. Um, so there's a GPS tra trace all the way out, but that's how they mark them. All right, and, and Be Becky wants to know, is your wife a youper? Um, she is now. Uh, she, was, <laughs> she, was, she was born in Lansing and came to Michigan Tech and I met her at Tech. And, uh, and she now is as much a youper as you can become. I think. <laughs> All right. So, how much better, Scott? Asks, Scotty asks this. How much better is a real snow tire to a typical all-season tire? Uh, amazing difference, I think. Um, and and the the best way to the best way to do that is to drive two side by side. Um, so I have all seasons on my truck. I have the exact same tires for summer and winter. And so my, I have Cooper all all terrains for the summer, and I have Cooper snow tires for the winter, very similar tires. And it's amazing the difference um, when, you, when you drive one versus the other. It's, it's pretty cool. No, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, I shall bring that up personally in my life because um, I have all season ones. And I remember saying, I don't think we should, I really think we should have snow tires, honey. 
Well, it's a, it's a tough one because it's another set of tires and you have to take them on and off and they are expensive. Yeah. And so it's, it's a tough one, but it's, it makes a big, big difference. And I, I put a lot of miles on a vehicle. So that, that plays into it too. But. What should I major in to become a snow scientist or a snow engineer? Well, Michigan Tech has a cur curriculum in civil engineering um, of cold region science. And that is um, studies things all the way from uh, avalanches to snow fences to what I've talked about here, snow metamorphism and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, I, sh I should know more of this more, but I've been kind of um, disconnected from it for a while, but I don't know how many students we have that take that curriculum anymore, but, um, but that's, that's what this, it's, it's mostly a civil engineering, geotechnical engineering type of background. Well, and, and James would like to know, Russ, were you passionate as, as passionate as a youth about snow as you are now? Um, or did it develop at, when you were in college? I'm always interested in where and when people find their passions. Um, it start, I started out fairly young. So, so growing up here, and, and you either like snow or you don't. And, uh, and I always tell people, if you don't like snow and you don't like the cold, go somewhere else, because <laughs> this is not <laughs> the place for you. Um, so, so I've always loved to be out in the woods and camp in the, out in the winter time. And, and I, I hunt and fish quite a bit. So I spent a lot of time that way. And then my dad was a professor and he did cold regions um, work type work. And I worked with him for many years. And, and uh, so that all kind of played into it. So, so at a very young age, I, I learned to love being out in the cold and I liked snow. I skied and, and um, snowmobile and, and all that sort of thing. So this is a, a nice comment from Matt. Um, he says, I had your dad for a hydrology course in the late seventies. And I think he was involved with KRC back then. What got you into doing snow research? Was it dad? It was definitely, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so dad was an ice guy and then I worked with him on ice projects and, and uh, just so happened that I got a job here at KRC as a part-time um, employee and uh, and it was ice related, it was building, a, building a test course on Lance Bay. And uh, that would have been in probably 1980. And um, I just ended up here ever since. So I, we, we start, I started doing work with snow and, and uh, snow and ice and, and that became my career. Well, and so your dad, when, what year did your dad retire around? Oh, it probably is. Gosh, 25 years ago for sure, if not a okay. little bit longer. Yeah, so well, and he, a, he, he pretty much he spent his whole career here, right? Um, he he taught some other places before then, uh, South Dakota State, and he was in um, in Colorado for a little bit, but for the most part, his whole career was at Tech. So then, a couple of questions about the KRC. Jane asks, how many clients do you get on average a year? And Mick asks, how late in the spring is it open? Um, well, we do year round testing. So, so in the summertime, we we work with soils as similar to we are um, to the way we work in in snow in the winter time. But our but the test course is most is a big chunk is winter test. So, um, so the winter testing is going on right now, and I mean we get a couple two hundred or more um, engineers technicians that come from companies uh, and are and are on the test course. And sometimes we have as many as 75 here at the same time. So it's super busy right now. There's vehicles going everywhere and there's engineers everywhere. And, and as I was mentioning earlier that the COVID thing has made that interesting. And so it's been, a, it's been an interesting year, but we're, but we're busy and we've got lots of people here. Well, and, and Darwin asks a question, um, has the days of available operation of KRC's test track changed over the years to any significant extent? I think he means with regard to snow testing. An example that I can think of is there more work at night required now, as you mentioned, to have the proper test temperature. Yeah, so so we're you know we're, we're of course a lot busier now, and 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 folks that are testing have have learned to that to to test in windows. So windows of temperature and windows of snowfall and that sort of thing. If they're testing tires or or different. Um, um, 
traction control, stability control, that sort of thing. And, and of course, those things have grown over the last few years. So, that, so it, it's, it's a lot different beast than it was many years ago. You know, and I, and I always look back at when I first started at KRC, we were getting cars that were five years out. So we'd have a, you know, it was 19, it was 19 or say 2000 and, and we were, and people were bringing in 2005 model cars. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Everything that's getting tested now is going out the door tomorrow kind of thing. And, and so, so the, so the design cycle is shortened way, way, way up. So you don't, you just don't see that anymore. So what we've got here on, on right now are cars that you're going to see next fall. Um, and they're being tested as fast as they can to make sure that they go out the door and, and don't have problems. Well, and I'm, I'm curious about that aspect. So they get a, like a certification that it took this many feet to stop with this tire. I have yeah, and the company and the companies do all kinds of different things like that. And in the, the, um, if you look at like the, the the snow mountain that I was shown, the little mountain and snowflake, that gets gets done a couple different ways. Uh, one is there there are special trucks that test traction, so they're they're spin up trucks. We call them spin up, um, and so we have spin up areas that spin up people are testing on. They test truck truck tires that way and car tires that way. Then there's also um, uh, folks that are out driving the cars and that's normally done to try and to try and match a tire to a car so they'll so yeah. they'll take a take a platform out and run a bunch of different tires on it and try and find out what the best tire is and of course that goes from not, not only traction braking that sort of thing so they're slamming on their brakes or climbing hills or stopping on hills and trying to climb and and all sorts of different things and then of course in the end it becomes cost too but so they're they're playing all those different things to, to finally come out the end of what tire goes on a, a Toyota Camry kind of thing. No, fascinating. So this question's from Richard. I've lived three years at a time in each of Fairbanks and Yellowknife. I found that traction friction on snowpack roads was significantly better from minus 20 F and below, I believe is what he's saying. Why is that? So you get, you, you get some grip from it being cold and that grip comes from the rubber slash pressure slash moisture actually freezing and sticking. So, so it's called a stick, stick grip that we get. So it happens at, at real cold because um, you, get that little, you get that little freeze and it can happen when the tire is actually moving. So, the, so it's harder and harder to get any freeze grip when the tire is turning. It's complicated, but something like that. So that's why you hear the squeakiness under your shoes when you're out and then you hear it now if you're out walking <laughs> down the street your shoes are squeaking and they're actually sticking to the you get that stick grip happening so ward asks are any of your photos um from the antarctica online especially the cre crevice crevasse and there might be a few um i was just just mentioning to janet earlier that it'd be fun to do i have a i have a couple talks that i do um, I do summer youth in the su every summer, and I do a, a, a talk on Antarctica, and and so I have several different talks with all my pictures in it, um, some from the older um, uh, expeditions and some from the newer ones, and that that'd be kind of fun to do someday. But I have lots of different photos. Um, it's fun fun to think back about how things changed over the years. So in 1995, all the all the pictures I had were on film. So I right. carried bags of films with me, film with me, slides and print. And then of course graduated to, to digital. It tells you how old I am. So <laughs> no, I, I I too took took all kinds of film pictures, even for my PhD. Um, so this is question is is um, were you scared when you were down inside? A crevasse, crevice. Sometimes. How do you yeah. say it? How do you say it? I keep saying yeah, it wrong. I always say crevasse, but it's, I've heard it said many, many, many different ways. Um, it's it's very weird to be down, especially the first few times. So so on on the crevasses that we studied, they have um, the particular areas that we're interested in have snow bridges over the crevasses that are flat, so you can't really see them. Um, and the way you find them is with a with a ground penetrating radar. And one of the things one of the things I was involved with there was the study of how how 
how do you do that? How do you, how does this, how do you see them with a ground penetrating radar? So we did lots of that. Um, and I worked with some folks from Krell. And I noticed a question there about Krell. So we work together with Krell folks all the time. In fact, they were just here. One of their teams was just here, left last week. And um, so I know lots of folks there and some of them are lots of tech grads at Krell. Um, with some interesting stories of that. Um, so in, in order to get inside these crevasses, we dynamite them open. And, and what you end up with is a, is a hole in the top of the crevasse. And then we wait a day to let the snow sinter back up because you've just blown it up with dynamite and of course made it fragile. And you let it bond back up and then you can repel down through the hole and get down into the crevasse. And they're sometimes, they're mostly between 100 and 200 feet deep. So you, so you repel down inside on a rope and, um, and get down in the bottom so you can like get measurements and study different things inside of them. And once you get down inside there, all you have is that small hole that you blew open with the with the dynamite. And it's kind of a weird feeling to know that all that snow is up above you and you're you're 200 feet down in the bottom of a minus 40 degree chunk of ice and and they're long. You can walk you can walk for a long time down through them and and inside of them. Kind of a kind of a weird. Does well, gosh, I have so many questions about the crevasse crevice. I can't say crevice. Um, why do they form? So there's how do they there's, form? Yeah, there's there's several different ways that they that they form. Um, so if you imagine um, a, a river of ice flowing down a glacier, flowing down um, through a, a valley, uh, and it and it comes around a corner. So it's 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 traveling around a corner. And and move, you know, ice is moving along. It tends to crack at the at the at the big bend side and compress on the inside of the turn. So outside of the turn it cracks, inside of the turn it it, it um, compresses. So you form crevasses on that outside of the turn. It also happens when it goes over a hill. So the the, the ice is bending going over the top of a hill and it opens up on the top and you end up with a crevasse on the top. Mm. So those are two different ways. And the other one is what we call a shear zone. And what that is, is two glaciers coming together. So one is, is hitting the other, one's flowing past and the other one's hitting, the, hitting that flowing ice and kind of bending as, it, as they hit. So one's tougher than the other one. So a small one bends against the big one and you end up with cracks along that part. Mm -hmm. And those are the tough ones because they don't bend. And you don't end up with a you, you, you don't end up with a bend in the in the um, snow bridge. So the so the ones on a glacier that are on the corners and on bends in the in the you know, going over a hill, you tend to get shadows because the the um, the snow bridge is bent or snow bridges sag, I should say, and you end up mm -hmm. with a shadow. Shear zones tend to be have flatter for some reason have flatter. Uh, covers on them and then they're harder to see. So those are pretty much the three ways that the, that crevasses form. Ah, so it's, it's amazing how much you know about, about snow. Um, all right, this question's from Paul. In MY101 in about 1977, we had a question regarding dirt doing, being beneficial for ice formation on a lake. If there were no dirt for ice crystals to form, would lakes freeze? Or how much colder would it need to be for lakes to freeze? Um, hmm, that's a tough question. Uh, I don't know that, I'm not sure I understand why, what the dirt part is. So it must be the nucleation piece. Um, yeah, so, so I, ice can actually nu nucleate without the particles. Um, and it, and it can freeze. Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. I, I have to say, I don't know the answer. I've been getting curious about this as well as, as you, we watch Lake Superior freeze and unfreeze. And it, you know, you see all that slurry just, just traveling around on the top of the surface and then finally consolidating. Yeah. And I, I wonder if the slurry, I wonder so, if the sl slurry is forming from the snow that's landing. Yeah. That, so that so snow ice, snow ice forms from snow crystals. So as they fall into the water, the, 
ice nucleates from them, but columnar ice, I, I don't think there's any particle involved there, but I, I might be wrong. So you, so you get the really crystal clear columnar ice that, that you can actually see the six sided crystals all standing up like pencils. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the really, you're out on Lake Superior and it's frozen the d two days before and, and, all, and you're walking on it, it looks like you're walking on water, it's crystal clear. And that's, that's your columnar ice. Mm -hmm. Snow ice looks like snow when it's yep, formed yep. from the snow falling in the water. So, again, I and and then there's frazzle ice that can you get ice formations from the frazzle. But I should know the answer. My dad's probably looking at me from up above right now, wondering <laughs> why I don't know the answer. I don't. So. so we only have time for a few more questions because we we call a hard stop at seven fifteen. Just very briefly, Connie wants to know, is the Clean Snowmobile Challenge happening this year? Clean Snowmobile Challenge will be virtual this year. So, and I'm, I, I, I'm not, haven't been involved too much in that yet. Um, Jay, Jay takes care of most of that. Jay and a couple other engineers from here. Um, my part of that is the, is the logistics. So uh, once, the, once the challenge, for the most part, once the challenge starts, um, making sure everything, uh, you know, test courses are set up and all that sort of thing. Um, so, so it's all virtual. They'll be, you know, doing reports and that sort of thing. I think it, there's a bunch of on a bunch of like zoom meetings and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully by next year, I, I think we're all hoping that by next year, things will be a little bit more normal. And well, and boy, is that a hoot to attend. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, uh, I, I, I was, I enjoyed very much visiting um during the judging of of and that's you could just access it's right along the airport road you can you kind of bump yeah, right into yeah. the test track yeah i know yeah, the clean snowmobile challenge is a blast it really it is. is a lot of fun yes. students students are a hoot i don't know about it <laughs> so john wants to know is are is there any electric vehicle testing that's yeah. been conducted at, at the yes, KRC? yes lots, lots yeah so so we've had electric buses, electric trucks, electric cars, and, and there's probably a bunch of them here right now. Although I I haven't been in, haven't been involved too much in what what that part of testing is, but but we have um, all kinds of chargers set up here and vehicles plugged in, and we have truck chargers and car chargers and, and all sorts of things. So lots of that going on. Well, and probably enough time for maybe one or two more questions or probably one more question and then maybe some closing remarks, um, Russ. Uh, and so um, this one is something that we all worry about, um, which is, um, you know, what is black ice? Does it belong to any of the categories of snow that you discussed at the beginning? How would you handle it while driving? And can you anticipate it when you drive? Um, well, well, black ice is, is the real crystal clear ice that I was just talking about that that can it can form from um, from water vapor so uh, really humid air and it can form from a light rain falling on on the pavement and that the the tough thing about uh, black ice is that you can't see it so the pavement looks fine and all of a sudden you're on something that's really slippery and and one of so one of the things with black ice is it's super slippery. And if you've ever, um, well, you see all the videos on on uh, the internet. If you if you search for it, cars just sliding along and, and not being able to stop and running into each other, and there's lots of silly videos like that. And that's black ice, super super slippery. Um, and it, we and some of the some of the court the ice rink that we have set up here at KRC can have that have that low of friction, so, and, it, and it's basically zero friction. The friction coefficient is 0.01 um, and that type of ice if you stop the vehicle and you try and get out it's pretty hard to walk like almost you almost can't do it you just fall down you just get on and, and fall down so so it, the thing that makes it dangerous is you're cruising along and all of a sudden um, and this happens on bridges quite a bit um, where the bridge will be covered with black ice the rest of the road's fine because it's warm bridge gets cold black ice forms on it and all of a sudden you're in the guardrail because you didn't realize it was coming. Um, crash control and stability control are really, um, can help that a lot. And, that, and I've, I've actually been in many times in my lifetime since, since I've driven vehicles with 
with a good system on them have been saved by hitting a bridge and, and I and I should know better because I because I, I study that um, where the vehicle takes over on me and says Ooh, and my heart goes boom you know that I, mm. that I was going a little fast and I should have been paying attention or whatever and so it's it's an interesting phenomenon um, but again it's the biggest thing is you you don't know it's there until it's too late usually. Yeah, I know. I remember a couple of people warning me after I after I moved here. Be very, very careful during the transition temperature, as it when when it's right around thirty two, it can be the roads can be very bad. But once it gets cold, the roads are pretty good, you know. And yeah, and just yeah. being very, very careful when when the temperatures at the transition. Yeah. So the the coating the coating that I have the um, the patent on uh, the bridge coating is is just for that. Um, so it, it's it's a way to drop the to um, uh, keep that ice from forming. So it low, lowers the freezing point and, and uh, keeps the ice from forming on bridges. So and that's just for that very reason. Oh, think of how many lives you've probably saved, Russ. I hope a few. Hope a few. Yeah. Well, or just uh, any closing remarks for us? You know, um, for any future Huskies who are out there, or for lots of our alumni who are out there and our Mission Tech family and friends? Uh, I don't know. Uh, get a black fleece jacket and, and look at some snowflakes. I don't know what there else There you say. go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll have to, we have to carry, you, you must have your magnifying glass in your black fleece jacket, yeah, right? I, I have one in my truck all the time. Yeah, no doubt about that. So, and and uh, I can't can't say, say enough about Michigan Tech. So I've got lots of history there and lots of family there and that sort of thing. So fun place it, to be. It has been a pleasure and a joy to have you um, this evening, Russ. And I, I hope I hope there's good news about your um, next grandchild by now. I haven't yeah, seen I any know, comments coming in. I don't know if she's still listening on there or not, but it's, I know I know she's supposed to be um, things are supposed to happen at eight o'clock. So she's probably in a hospital bed by now. So well, may God bless your future grandchild and your daughter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, right. everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, was join fun. us next week. Yeah. See you next week. Thank you. Bye, Russ. See ya.